we end as we end this year and think about starting the next, we're going to look a little bit about redeeming the time. The Bible says in Colossians chapter four and verse five uh, that this this um, series of verses here, at least through the first six or so, um, talk about walking in wisdom. And the only true wisdom comes from, from Christ and His Word. So uh, let's look at what we can do about redeeming the time. The Bible says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And in fact, in verses uh, 5 and 6, I have like different three different sermons I preach out of that from time to time. But verse 6 says, let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt, that you may know you ought, how you ought to answer every man. And the Bible gives us the insight and wisdom that we can answer people when they ask questions. But it's biblical wisdom. It's godly wisdom. But anyway, as we think about redeeming the time, we, think we have to think about what the fact of what is time. Time is a measured duration. Hours, days are periodic revolutions. And then there are a successive durations such as past, present and future. Time is a limited duration that in unlike eternity, time will cease. Uh, time's going to cease. One of the great hymns of the faith reminds us when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the glory of his resurrection share when the earth, when the saved of earth are gathered over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And I hope you will be. But when that happens, time ends. Because eternity, there's no time in eternity. The Bible says God knows the end from the beginning. How do you do that? Because there's no time. <laughs> God created time for us. He created time that we would know, knew, knowing that our bodies, especially in sin, uh, after we were kicked out of the garden and so forth, um, I still believe time was established before that because the Bible talks about the days. He, in the morning and the evening in the morning with the first day and so forth. So God developed time for mankind you know, to know when to rest and when to do certain things. and But it's, it, it, it's an important uh, element to our existence. But eternity is absolute. Time is not. It will end for all of us, either through death or through the rapture. Time will end. The Bible talks to God sent back in Genesis 6, 3, that my spirit will not always strive with man forever. So there, there was a time when God's spirit will not strive. Uh, there's a time when, the, and I, I think I look at that in, in our day is when the Holy Spirit's dealing with your soul, dealing with you to come to Him, when He's tugging on your heart strings. Um, he, he loves you. He'll, uh, I, he's gone the extra mile because He died on the cross for you, was died, was buried, and rose from the dead. He loves you, but there's going to come a time when you keep resisting and rejecting. There may come a time God will say that's enough. Now, I, I'll, I'll never know when that is, and I'll never tell somebody, if they come to me and say, I don't feel this, or I don't feel that. Well, I'm not going to say God stopped dealing with you. I don't know that, but I, I can tell you, uh, I do believe that there will come a time when God, God had already, God told it back, to, in, back in Genesis that there, there's a time His Spirit's not going to always strive with you. And so if, if He said it then, He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if, if it was true then, it's going to be true today. But that's the sad part. Because God loves you, and He, and I think He, I mean, for most of us, I don't know of any testimony where someone said, God, God dealt with me once and I let it go and He never dealt with me again. That may very well be. I've never heard that. I, I've heard many testimonies where God dealt with me throughout the years and He kept coming back to me and kept coming back and finally I just couldn't stand it anymore. Amen. And that's the grace of God. That's His love. Amen. But He doesn't have to do that. He, he's extended your time in the same way with Hezekiah. Remember when he came to Hezekiah, Hezekiah, get your house in order for you're going to die and not live. Hezekiah pleaded with the Lord and God gave him 15 more years. Uh, his time was over. God, God extended it. God can do that. But time will come to an end mm. as we understand it. Time will come to an end. What's the importance of time? It seems that Scripture refers uh, this by means of, of mentioning today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. 
So if you need to get saved now, if you're still breathing and still uh, um, living, and God's dealing with you, right now is the time you need to get saved. He's let you live to hear it once again, to be convicted once again, and now's the time. Don't put it off. When God's dealing with you, come run to Him then. Amen. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't don't say I've got more time because you don't. You're not. You're not promised it any more time. But if God's dealing with you now, you know in your heart that there has to be a change. And when you refuse and you reject that, then you could very well be cutting off your. Um, the next, you might think, well, I'll, I'll get it down the road. There may not be a down the road. Okay. He may just stop coming to you because you've rejected him and rejected what his son has done. The Bible talks about this is the acceptable year of the Lord. You know, the Bible talks about that it's appointed unto man once to die. It's appointed. If there's a time, once to die. And after this, the judgment. Time is important because it's fleeting. Someone said, time and tide wait for no man. The passing of time is like putting, and this is a good illustration, the passing of time is like putting your fingers in, a, in, in, in you know, running water, running brick, uh, uh, brick or river or something where you put your hand in there and the water just kind of runs on through your fingers. A little bit stops, but most of it keeps on flowing. That's time. It doesn't stop. It, it, it might take you somewhere. You know, if you were, uh, if the river's big enough and you get on there, you, you're going to follow the river. It's gonna, and time will take you somewhere. And I've thought back often since I was a child or in high school, uh, gosh, now 40 years ago, 50, almost 50 years ago, when I was in high school, 40-something years ago, and then all of a sudden I'm thinking, I, I, I remember thinking back then, man, I've got all this time to go. And here it is, here I'm kind of my age now looking back and I'm thinking, where did it go? Hmm. Time moved us right on. And some, there were some things I wish, there, there were some little hamlets or little incos, you know, that I wish Tom hadn't taken me to. I wish I'd have been smarter. And there are other places I'm glad that he did. But time moves on. Right. Time moves on. It, it all boils down to who's navigating you on the sea of time. That's right. And then you don't have to look back and discuss. Or you can look back in great um, joy. The passing of time... The Egyptians quoted time as a serpent creeping along, uh, creeping along silently and gliding away unnoticed. And it does, doesn't it? Uh, and, and we've discussed this a lot, but they say the older you get, um, you know, the more time seems to pass. Well, time's still 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but it's what you do. There, there's, I have noticed throughout the year that when, when I was a child, there seem to be greater divisions from summer and winter and, and even, even the different sporting events and stuff like that. Everything overlaps now. There's no real distinction anymore. And the last several years have not really been a whole lot of distinction between winter and summer. It, it, you know, all of a sudden you have cold, cold, and then all of a sudden it's warm. You know, the weather, I mean, when I was little, it seemed like there was a more gradual thing. All those kind of things represent the different delineations of time and things. Um, but you, you seem to notice things different. But there's one thing for sure. I remember standing when we uh, preached last year over at, uh, over at Brother Ed's church on Christmas Eve and then had our Christmas Eve service last year and here we had it again this year already. It just doesn't seem possible. It, you know, to me, it should be just March now. It shouldn't be uh, December 31st going into the next year. Just Time just seems to move on. And it's almost unnoticed, except for the fact it's so quick. <laughs> you know, it seems so quick. How do we use time? In, in boyhood, much time is wasted in laziness and sluggishness. Not for everybody, but for most of us. In youth and self-indulgence. In manhood, lost in chasing the dream. And in older years, so often we spend time reflecting on how things should have been, or how well we've used our time, and we're still waiting for the big score. How many people do you know uh, that, are, that, that work hard and all that, but they're still waiting for that big score? They're, they're, they're going to invest in this, or play the lottery, or do this, and they're waiting for the big one. And they die, and that big one never came. Because they're wasting their time waiting on the big one. Isn't that sad? What a, what a, waste, of, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Redeem. What's the word mean? It generally means to retrieve that which has been taken or lost, such as property, liberty, even our souls from which we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Our text seems to indicate that redeeming, the redeeming to be done is that, that of seasons of opportunity. Take the seasons of opportunity to live for the Lord. Take the time 
to live for Him. Don't just look, don't just look at your circumstances and say, I have to do this and I have to do this. Let me tell you something. As you start 2018, look at the circumstances and say, yes, I have to go to work. Yes, I have to do this. But God, help me to redeem the time. Help me as I'm, as I'm doing what you've allowed me to do in life to make a living. Help me to do it as unto you that people will see that I'm living for Jesus, that I love Jesus, and everything I do is for Him. And I, I want them to see this. And before the end of 2018, we'll have a whole brood that has come to know Christ because I'm redeeming the time mm. for you. And not just for me. I'm redeeming the time. I'm living for Him daily. I mentioned that in Sunday school. We're, we're always waiting for the big event. Churches have big events. And yes, we're, you know, great revivals. All that's wonderful. But do we, we expect everything to happen then? Man, we got this great revival. We had 40 people saved and all that. Well, that's wonderful. But you know what? Uh, whether you have a great meeting or not, every day should be a great revival in our lives that people see a difference in us. Hmm. They're not going to worry about, people don't want to just see what happens at, at a great evangelistic meeting when there's a couple hundred people and all that's wonderful, but they're going to look at you when you're walking down the aisle of Walmart and somebody crashes into you with their, because people drive their cars like they drive their cars. And you know, they just come out and pull out in front of you and look at you like you're crazy. I mean, all that stuff, and, and we tend to forget that when we're in that aisle, when we're walking down that aisle, when we're walking down Safeway or Walmart or or, or, or Wise or any, any place else in the public, we're the church. Right. And we forget that we're the church. We should be acting different. Because when that person comes to us in the middle of, of the frozen food section and asks us why we're so happy, they're coming to the church mm. to see what's going on. And they don't have to come into this building, which is important. I mean, it's good. To, it's a good place to have. But they should be. You should give them the same answer after you've had a hard day, and after everything's gone wrong that day for you physically, and everybody seems to be against you. You're you're going to redeem the time when you can take all of that in. And somebody says, "Why are you like you are?" Because after after the day that I've had, I can still tell you that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And He's my Savior. And I love him. And I've had a rough physical day, but my spiritual day is still on cloud nine. Amen. Because of he who I might serve. Help us, Lord. That's redeeming the time. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Our, in all actuality, time itself cannot be redeemed. One, one, once a minute's gone, it's gone. Once a second's gone, it's gone. Once an hour's gone, it's gone. This past year, in, a, in, in about, uh, what, six, seven hours, or 12 hours from now, it's going to be gone. 2017 is going to be gone forever, as we understand it. You're not going to get it back. I wish we could come back. I wish I could go back to, to March 13th and redo what I said then. You know, or re that's, that's not. you got to start from there, but, but you redeem the time. Let's, let's indicate... I mean, I'm not big on making promises for next year and all that stuff, <laughs> but we can make a we can make a determination to the Lord. Lord, you you've given us this block of time. It's something we look at as a new beginning, and maybe maybe next year, may I start out tomorrow morning as soon as I get up, getting on my face before you, and for the next 365 days, I'm going to get up and praise you every morning before I take a step out the door. Mm. I'm going to ask you to help me to redeem the time that is tough. Stuff goes wrong. You know, if Michelle's company does sell out and, and, and all of a sudden they, they don't have jobs that God knows she, she needs another job. God, I'm, I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be upset. Help me to redeem the time yes. that I'll show Jesus in all of this. Will it hurt? Sure it hurts. Do you worry? Of course you're going to worry a little bit. Well, where am I going to get my next paycheck? But God, help me to redeem the time to show them that I'm trusting in you. Hmm. That you said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. That you know our needs and we're not extravagant. And now, you've tried to live extravagant and then you're above your means, you might have to face a little problem. But that might be sometimes God helps us to face a problem. you got to slow down. you got to stop what you're doing. Live within the means and I'll bless you. You know, I'll, I'll help you through it. Uh, a similar situation may arise in your life, uh, but nothing will ever be exactly the same as the time you, there's a time you're in. We're in 2017. Things gone through. Something similar may come out in 2018, but it won't be exactly the same. You know, so we, we can't look at things the same. We we got to understand that things are moving on. Time's moving on. Um, and I'm going to say this, and I want you to hear what I'm saying. 
The primary purpose of time is not to create great wealth or great empires or even to raise children or to have wonderful marriages or even just have fun and die. That's not, that's not the primary purpose of time. The primary purpose of time for you and I and for any, any physical breathing person that has a soul that God has put in there by his breath, the primary purpose of time is for mankind to prepare themselves for eternity. That's what time is here for. Now, we have to live. I don't think there's any problem with having fun. I don't think there's any problem with, with, with doing well. But you've got to keep all that in perspective. But the primary, it, it is a horrible thing to live this life and be blessed. It's a horrible thing to live this life and, and, and God's blessing has been up on you. You have a great job. You have a great home. You have a great family. And all those things. And even if you do good, good things to people, all that's wonderful. But the problem is, you, you want to live this life and live to 100 years old. But if you die without Christ, you've, you're, all the blessings you'll ever have are here. Because you, he, you'll get to those gates and he'll say, I never knew you. God gave you. And, and if somebody lives 100 years old, that's, that's grace, folks. In this day and time. So there's a lot of people who do that. I know that. And some of them I believe are saved. But I believe there's a lot of them aren't. And God lets people live. I mean, they let, He lets people live out even longer than, 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 than you know, three score and ten, which is 70 years old. God lets people, a lot of people live out. And, and, and if they're not saved, that's just grace giving them another chance, I believe, to hear the gospel and to receive Christ and to, and, and to come to Him. That's grace. Because when they stand before the judgment seat, God said, yeah, you know, I, had, I gave you 105 years old, and you still reject him. Mm. I mean, I gave you all this time. They have had to have heard the gospel at one time or another. In this country especially, they had to have heard of the wonderful gift of salvation, and they still reject it. And then there's some people who, who may live 20 years, and all of a sudden God takes them. But if they're saved, what a wonderful, what a wonderful transformation. What a wonderful gift. I sometimes wonder if people that live, in, they say the good die young, and sometimes I wonder if God doesn't let nastier people live on so they can get saved. They can still hear. I wonder about that sometimes. It's still your choice. When you're at the age of accountability, no right from wrong, and you heard the gospel and you reject it, God didn't have to do anything after that. There, there, there's no promise beyond that. But he did. He accepted the promise of his love. And he keeps convicting and if you keep rejecting, then someday that's going to be all over. Listen to me. It's not necessary that man have anything the world offers. It's not necessary that you have anything here. But it's absolutely necessary that you have all the Lord offers. And that's His blood. We all say, well, what? I can't get along. Yeah, you can get along in this world with probably a lot less than what you have. But folks, you don't have to have great mansion. You don't have to, I mean, you don't have to have the best car. You don't have to have the best, uh, you know, God, God, if you're in Him, God will provide for you. But I can tell you one thing. If you face Him in eternity, you would better have what He offered. And that's His Son. And that's the blood of His Son. We, we, had, <laughs> we had better have all that God has provided for. Now, what do you mean by redeeming the time? It's, it's, it's like a farmer how he prepares the field for the upcoming season, uh, removing any obstacles from the ground, then sows the seed at the proper time. Uh, where would the farmer be if he did not habitually make good use of his time in preparing for the harvest? Uh, I remember when I watch these guys, we have guys, the farmer down here, he plows this field, and this field, and he alternates them every year. And sometimes we'll have wheat over here, or, or corn, or he'll have um, a green, you know, a, uh, green stuff over there, grass or whatever, and he feeds his cows down here. Um, he, they're very, they're very good about that. Now watch them. You can see about clockwork about when when they start preparing the field and then planting and then reaping, and cutting or whatever they do. Uh, and they always seem to have enough for what they have down there. I remember a pastor a friend of mine years ago. He, he was a much bigger church, but he was in a suit and tie most of the time. But he had a pair of old shoes he had back in his house and. Uh, they always had a big garden. He loved his garden. And he would go out there, and he'd be out there in shirt and tie, suit and tie, with his old shoes on, be out there home in that garden. But it was the most beautiful garden you've ever seen. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you're going to plant seed and water and grow, you've you got to keep the weeds away. 
You, you got to get out there and hoe. So he redeemed the time trying to make sure that when his garden came in, it, he'd have to go through the weeds and the muck and the guck and stuff that grows in there. He, but he did have the cleanest garden. And he would, he, you know, in, in between meetings and stuff, he'd go out there and put them old shoes on, take his coat off, and get out there in that shirt and tie and weed his garden, and hoe his garden, the hoe. Man, he, he just kept that so clean and nice. You know, the greatest instrument we can and should use daily after we have planted the gospel seed is the hoe of prayer. <laughs> we, ought to, we ought to get that hoe out and start praying. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul said, I, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. I believe that all that um, planting and watering was followed up with a lot of spiritual hoeing of prayer. Hmm. Paul, Paul watered and planted he planted and watered and he prayed for people but he, he got out there and tried to keep the weeds away he, he got out there and tried to ask God to, to, to let, let that seed grow and he prayed for them and prayed for their minds and prayed that God would, would intercede and, and just keep the filthy things and, and the things that would grow around that seed just keep it clean so the seed can, can grow where it was planted I believe sometimes we are not redeeming the time by, first of all, our unbelief. When we witness, be it personally or at the church or a group setting, most of the time, there's a lot of times I've learned that people really don't expect anything to happen. We, we do, but well, it's, it's the day we're living in, and it's the things going on, and that's not really going to happen. But we should pray for it, but we don't really believe anything is going on. Well, that's our fault. Uh, we, we ought to believe God's going to do what He promised. And, and if they don't, then that, that, that's up to him. But well, he should never be able to point his finger at us and say, well, yeah, you had the seed planted, but you sure didn't take care of it. I mean, yeah, yeah you told so-and-so about Jesus, but you sure didn't follow up any. You didn't pray for him. You never didn't, didn't check on him. When's the last time we planted the seed and followed up with intense prayer, quote, watering the seed that had been planted? And then limited attempt. Uh, attempt. Psalm 126, 6. He, he, now, I love this. I love this verse. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again. Doesn't say just coming. He said doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Part of the cultivating is the watering with our tears over the loss in which we have planted the seed. David said in Psalm 56, 8, Lord, put thou my tears in, into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? What does that mean? Haven't, haven't I proven that, that I, have, I have concern and compassion for people? Haven't I, haven't I been redeeming the time praying for them? Haven't, haven't I been asking you to, to bless in certain areas? Lord, you got it written down. I, I firmly believe that God has recording angels all around us just taking notes on everything we do. I, I think He knows. Uh, and that's just for our sake. God, God knows anyway. But everything He knows, everything He does that, that we do, He understands. He knows. He's got a record of it. And David said, "Lord, I've been praying for these people. I've been praying for so and so. I've been praying to get back into Your house. I've been praying for this. Lord, put my tears into Thy bottle." So Dr. Bob Gray said, "God, David knew God carried a bottle, and he was in the business of collecting tears." Well, what in the world for? For all the seeds we planted. Let me tell you something. If you care about somebody and you're really concerned about it, it may take years. You've heard me talk about Mrs. Harrington and her husband, and she prayed. I remember uh, it had to be 40 years she prayed for her husband. He, she, was, she was a wonderful, uh, godly woman, came, taught Sunday school in our little church over there in, in, in Delta. But every Sunday she would request prayer for her husband. And I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Uh, of course, I was very young, so she had been doing this a long time before I was even born. I was like 14 or 15. And uh, uh, during the service one Sunday, she, she had gotten up and prayed for her. She please pray for my husband. And uh, he never came to church. I think he dropped her off a few times. But he, he never came to church. He'd go on back and come back and get her. Or she would ride with somebody. But all the whole time when I was growing up in church, so I was 14 or 15, maybe 16. Um, she, she'd be praying. I remember every Sunday she'd pray for him. And buddy, she planted that seed and she watered it with her tears. And, and uh, uh, we, we all prayed for him. And everybody thought, well, you know, it's been so long. 
But I'll never forget one, one Sunday he came through that back door and just said, I can't stand it anymore. King walked right up to the altar and got saved. Amen. And, and let me tell you, it, it works. Yes. It may take a while, but it works. But I can tell you it's never going to work if you plant the seed and never follow up with that holding that needs to be done. Get the weeds out of the way. Be consistent in your prayers, especially for your family members, those that you love, those that you're concerned about, those that see you living every day. Um, listen, let, don't, don't be ashamed to let them see you pr crying and praying and pleading for God about their souls. And let, them, uh, uh, let, let the Lord take that water that He collects from your uh, agony over their lostness and he takes it and when you're begging and pleading and that, that, that seed will go in deep that he'll take that and water that with your tear and it starts to grow. It starts to grow. What's that mean? It means you're redeeming the time. You're not letting time pass. If somebody got, got somebody on your heart that needs to be saved, come to know Christ and you haven't been praying for them, shame on you. If, if you plan, well I told them about Jesus, then pray about it. Plead with God a little bit. Somebody came to Dr. Bob Gray one time and said, you know, I've been praying for my, my husband for years and I've been weeping over him and I just can't cry anymore. I just don't have the tears left. And she, he said, he, he said, but you got to. He said, he said if, if God is going to send His Son to die for your sins on the cross, if God is going to send His Son to be born of a virgin, raised in this physical body and die for you and raised from the dead for you, you may have to squall a little bit to get a man. But it's worth it. You might have to plead a little bit. God sent His Son to die for him. Is it going to hurt us to plead and cry and pray a little bit? Mm. To get somebody in, let that seed start growing? How do we get there? How do we start redeeming the time? Well, first of all, I, I believe that we do it by start praying for personal revival with the Lord. My, my prayer for this year is, and I guess for most years, but it's just especially for this year, you know, we come over here every Friday night, some of us meet and we pray about revival and about and an awakening in our area, and our little church will be a catalyst for that, that God will put us in the place where we, we can be that. I, I, I was reading where someone said, when a handful of people start praying about revival and about revive us personally, because if you're personally revived, then you're going to come to church and, there, and, and, and if others are praying for personal revival, then you're going to have a bunch that's got, going to have personal revival. Then the church is going to get revived and start doing the things that we need to do. The Bible, the psalmist asked God one time in Psalm 85, 6, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Mm. Lord, revive me. Lord, it's been an interesting year now, but I don't want 2017. I want to look at 2018 as a new year, as a, as a new field, as, as a new opportunity. And God, help me take that first step tomorrow morning when I get out of bed with, with an attitude of revival. Lord, revive my heart. Take the things away that hinder me. Help me to do things that, that, that will exalt you. And revive my soul, Lord. Revive me that I'll do the work that you've called me mm. to do. Will you not revive me, Lord? Mm. Will you not touch me? Will you not, uh, Psalm 80, 18, Lord, will, you, will you not quicken us? Will you not revive us? That we may call upon my name and know that you're hearing us? Sometimes it seems kind of muted because we call on God. We've got things that are in life we're about to revive. Is that desk right there? Man, we've got to get back to the point and understand that we're redeemed. Amen. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Mm. We're, we're redeemed because of his love for us and help us to show that. Not just go out. I mean, we can go out and make a big production, and all that sometimes is necessary. But I'm just telling you, when when, when things are going wrong or when they're going well, that that you're the same. That that you walk in the love of Christ. Hmm. Lord, revive me that people will see a difference. Revive me that I won't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Revive me that I'll tell somebody, hand out a track or two, that somebody will see that if they spit in my face and they spit in my face, they spit in yours, they turn, pulled your beard out by the roots, the oh, Lord just help me to take it hmm. if it'll get somebody saved. The Apostle Paul said, I want to be all things to all men that by some means some of them will get saved. That's his desire. What's our desire? What's our desire? Psalm 119, 25 says, Lord, revive me according to your word. It says, revive me according to your way. 
Revive me according to your righteousness. Revive me according to your loving kindness. God, you take a hold of me and, and you get the stuff out of me that doesn't need to be there and you put the stuff in there like your love and compassion and grace for people and revive me and help me to walk not just as a Baptist walks or not just as a Methodist walks or not just as a Presbyterian walks but help me to walk as a Christian walks. One who loves you and lives for you and prays to you and believes what you say and that your word is truth in my life and that I'll stand on the word starting tomorrow morning and for the next 365 days that and when I end 2018 I can look back and say I've glorified God mm. and he's, his, his life and his word has been blessed because of my life and praise God for it. That's mm. what I believe. Are, are you ready to redeem the time? Mm. Are you ready to live for a little while? i got so many things going on. we got so much stuff going on at work. God knows about your work. God knows before you do what's going on at work. God, God knows. But you don't know my boss. God knows your boss. Mm. God, God, God knows you're there because your boss probably needs you there. Don't go in there and hit him over the head with stuff. Just live the way you're supposed to live in Christ. It'll be noticed. Some people won't like it. They may even fire you for it. God knows that too. When are we ever going to get back to the understanding that God understands? Mm. God's got it in control. Well, if I lose my job, I lost the I mean, kind of income. I've got to have this. Let me tell you something. If you lose your job and God gives you something less, God's going to take care of you. Right. Or he lied. I mean, I'm going to say, well, but I've got to have $100,000 a year. I can't live. Or maybe you're living too high. <laughs> I don't know. But I can tell you this. If God provides for you and, and, and you lose your job and you get another job to help keep me through, it's, it's amazing how things can work out when God's involved. I'm not kidding. My mom and dad are a testimony of that. I remember them saying many times, and dad had a pretty good job. He wasn't he wasn't, he didn't make it rich. But I can tell you this. There were times when they would pay a bill and they said, I'm not sure how we pay that. Because we didn't have it. You know, something would come up, car or something, but all, and all of a sudden it was there. I mean, I'm, I, mean I, I can tell you from our own experience, there have been times when all of a sudden something was there. I'm saying, well, how do we get the money to pay that? Well, so we go back, so and so again. But you don't always realize God just God just God. Amen. I mean, He can do it. I'm not saying you're not wise. You should be wise with your money. Wise, but I'm telling you, we we so underestimate the ability of God's ability to do what He promised, especially when we're trying to live for Him and live right. Well, this is I'm across now. How we're we supposed to dig, dig out of this? God's got an awful big shovel. And you've heard me say it a hundred times. When you are facing an obstacle, God is facing open room. Because mm. there's no obstacle with God. Amen. There's nothing. But I will say one thing. If, if you'll bless God, if you'll tithe, give, give your first things to God, it's amazing the blessings that come. And it's amazing the blessings that don't when God's not first. He doesn't stop loving you. He wants you to understand that He needs to be first in everything that you do. He needs to be first. Man, when he's put first, watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Yeah, but so many things go wrong. Well, that's the world. But there's nothing There's nothing goes wrong with Christ. Because he's always, he's always there. And he'll provide for his children. He'll provide for you. So let me ask you this morning, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, are you ready to redeem the time? You want to start out next year, but the first thing you do in the morning, you put your foot on the floor after the new year comes. Say, all right, Lord, today, today, help me to understand that everything I do is for you. And that I want to redeem the time around people by living for you. And let people know who, who I am in Christ and why and what Christ has done for me. Help me take every opportunity to, to speak for you, Father. Help me to redeem the time. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would bless us. Bless those who are here now as we take this time of communion. I just pray that um, anyone here that's saved is welcome. But I pray that we all, as your, your Bible tells us, to judge ourselves. And to look, and if there's anything in there that um, is a hindrance, that we would confess that right now. And get it out of the way. And just... Uh, uh, ask you to forgive us and so we can eat and drink of your word of, of the, this communion of the wine and the 
bread freely and not trample on your blood. And Father, I'll give you praise for it all. In Jesus' precious name, amen.